Okay, so uh, finally, uh, we uh, will move on to our last speaker. Uh, he's our, uh, he's my colleague in uh, our headquarters in Spain. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Nasser Al-Asmar Pinar. Dr. Pinar has uh, received his bachelor's degree in pharmacy and his uh, master's degree in biotechnology of the human assisted reproduction and his PhD in biomedicine and biotechnology at uh, Valencia uh, University in Valencia, uh, Spain. He has over 15 years of clinical and research uh, lab uh, experience and currently he holds a position of scientific advisor for iGenomics uh, USA, Spain and Latin America. Let's welcome Nasser. Okay, so yours. Thank you very much, Andy, for the nice introduction. And thank you all uh, to be here today with, with us. Um, I'm glad to be here in order to talk to you about uh, the molecular analysis of products of conception. So I guess that, um, and I hope that at the end of the talk, you will be like, like me, like uh, thinking that why it's so important to analyze these products of conception by a molecular way. So it's not regular karyotyping, but a molecular way. Okay, so we all know that the incidence of spontaneous clinical abortion in general population, it's around 15%. And uh, in mostly in the, uh, most of them, around 80% occurs before the 12th week of gestation, which could be considered as a kind of biological barrier. Um, chromosomal abnormalities, we do know that are the most frequent cause for those clinical miscarriages. So um, chromosomal abnormalities or aneuploidies, you know that are alterations in the number of chromosomes that can cause those spontaneous abortions or and chromosomal abnormalities in newborn. We do know that more than 50% of the miscarriage in the first trimester are the result of those aneuploidies or chromosomal abnormalities, but this can increase up to 60% among women who have undergone assisted reproduction treatment. So despite knowing a multitude of etiological factors, some abortions remain of unknown cause. We know a lot of causes that can cause a clinical miscarriage, such as genetics, immunological causes, such as autoimmune, like antiphospholipid syndrome, autoimmunes, alloimmunes, like uh, killer immunoglobulin receptors, anatomical causes, such as the um, anti-mullerian uh, malformations in the uterus, endocrinological like uh, corpus luteum insufficiency, PCOS, diabetes with a bad treatment, hematological with non-antiphospholipid thrombophilias, can cause also uh, an abortion uh, infection at the endometrium level, like uh, with pathogens, when, with Garnarella, Prevotella, Atopovium, and so on. There is more and more research being done right now with chronic endometritis that you know that around 30% of patients with infertility can have a clinical condition such as chronic endometritis that could lead into a miscarriage. Also an alterated or abnormal microbiome, even patients with obesity can can to be like more uh, miscarriages because maybe chromosomal abnormalities at the at that level. But I'm gonna be focused on this talk in the part of that we are experts that it's genetics. So I'm gonna talk to you about the chromosome problems. So in this study from Robinson and Coles, they study and analyzed the first miscarriage in a patient. And if that patient had another miscarriage, they analyzed the products of conception as well. So in their study, they found that around 60% of the patients had a problem with uh, an abnormal uh, chromosomal analysis of the products of conception. But if this same patient had another miscarriages, they found that 20% more chances to have a second miscarriage that it's going to be chromosomally normal as well, from 58 to 78%. But in the same way, they found that patients with a trisomy or another abnormality, they had 20% more chances as well to have a second miscarriage with a chromosomal abnormality. This is a paper that I like a lot from uh, the, the group of William Kute that they uh, perform an analysis with uh, the 
protocol that uh, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the ASRM, uses usually for the patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. And also they analyze those same patients and perform chromosomal analysis of the products of conception. So this is what they did. They had like 100 patients and they performed the workup, regular workup from the ASRM. They found 55% that patients that were normal for that protocol. And then they found 45% that were abnormal. What is the protocol? So the protocol for the ASRM uh, workup is to analyze uh, for genetics. They, did do, they do parental karyotypes. They do also anatomic evaluation, endocrinic evaluation, and autoimmune factors. So they found that out of this 45% of abnormal RPL workup, uh, 4% were uh, abnormal parental karyotypes. So they did genetic counseling. They found 19% of abnormal anatomic evaluation. So they target surgical correction. They found 9% of abnormal endocrinology evaluation, so they target medical correction, and they found 17% of abnormal autoimmune factors, so they did, they give the patient aspirin, heparin, calcium, vitamin D. But uh, they had like three, you, you could perform for your patients three different strategies to identify the cause of the miscarriage. So what they do is first miscarriage, there's no action taken unless clinical indication, but when the patient had a second miscarriage, you can perform the ASRM workup, like I just uh, mentioned to you. You can perform the chromosomal analysis of the products of conception. But what this study tells us is that if you perform both combined, you are going to achieve up to 95% of the cases that you will know what happened with the miscarriage, what was the cause of the miscarriage. So you are going to miss only 5% of the cases that the reason uh, remains unknown. But what should we do first? I mean, we are going to do both combined, but obviously it's not the same if you start with the ASRM workup or if you start with the chromosomal analysis. So let's take a look on the money part because we do know that sometimes the money is so important, the cost of the, of the test is so important because uh, the patients sometimes cannot achieve that. So if we start performing the ASRM workup, okay, they have 100 patients again. So the total cost for this ASRM uh, RPL workup would be around 330K US dollars. If it is abnormal, you already know what was the cost of the miscarriage. So you're stopping here. But if you get normal, that again, they found 55% of patients that were normal for this ASRM uh, workup then you have to perform a molecular approach of the product of conception. So you have to add an extra 38K US dollars. So at the end, in total, for those patients, you have to pay 367K US dollars, okay? So let's put in the other way. Let's start at the beginning with the molecular analysis of the products of conception. So then the total cost for the 100 patients would be 70k US dollars, then you will achieve around 67% of chromosomal abnormalities. So those patients, you already have the diagnosis, but then you have to analyze the 33% remaining for the regular uh, ASRM workup. So then you have to add uh, 110 US dollars K. And at the end of the day, you will have a total for those patients of 178k US dollars. So comparing both approach, you will see that if you start with the ASRM RPL workup, you will have a double of the cost than if you start with the regular probes of conception molecular analysis. So obviously, if you can do both, it's going to be better. But if you only can choose one of them, you will go for the chromosomal analysis because it is gonna take it's gonna tell you a higher number of patients what happened with this problem and also it's going to be more cost effective as you can see on the slide. So what they propose in order to analyze the patients is first miscarriage, there's no action uh, taken unless clinically indicated. but at the second miscarriage, 
you will obtain the products of conception and you will analyze and you will do the analysis of molecular of these uh, chromosomes and then if you find an abnormal result an aploidy on the POC there's no further evaluation you already know what was the cause of the miscarriage if you find an unbalanced chromosomal translocation or inversion you will perform parental karyotypes in order to know if this was inherited from them and if you have a euploid approach of conception analysis then you will go and you will perform the rpl workup that we already mentioned before so here you can see the results for the classical cytogenetic studies on a spontaneous miscarriage when around 50 percent would be normal and we do know that around 95 percent will be de novo numerical abnormalities the problem with these karyotype studies with these classical cytogenetic studies is that uh, we will have around 42 percent actually in between 20 to 90 percent depending of the papers we will have a cell culture failure so after one month we will have to tell you as a, as a doctors that we don't have any result because the cell culture was failure and you will have to face your patients and tell them that we don't have anything so we cannot tell them anything we cannot give any ad advice and approximately around 30 percent of the cases will be false negatives due to maternal cell contamination because if you have a result as a normal xx normal female you won't know if these results come from the mother or from the fetus so actually, if we compare the molecular approach than the conventional karyotype, conventional karyotype requires in vitro cell culture and the molecular approach, no cell culture is required. Actually, you go directly to the, uh, to the sample and then you extract the DNA and you analyze this DNA. Conventional karyotype, you have results in one month and the molecular approach is around one week, 10 days. In conventional karyotype, the results obtained in 58% of the cases and the molecular approach you have results in 99 percent of the cases although you have around 13 to 15 percent of cases that you can have as a result um, maternal cell contamination in the conventional karyotype you will have around 30 percent of cases with false negatives um, because we, we we said before that you cannot say if result is normal xx if these results comes from mother or from fetus there is no false negatives due to maternal cell contaminations because we are using a technology of STRs, short and then repeats, that I'm going to explain to you now. And with conventional karyotype, you have lower resolution analysis. And with the molecular approach, you have higher resolution on the analysis. So what would be an indication to perform an analysis of pros of conception? So first, we have couples with recurrent miscarriage or previous unemployed conception because we do know that those patients will have higher probabilities to have an abnormal approach of conception analysis also infertile couples undergone ART we said before that up to 60 percent of those couples are going to have a miscarriage with chromosomal abnormalities also couples with a severe male factor we do know that couples with a male with all a severe oligosospermia so under 2 million per milliliter of spermatozoa, they might have higher chances to have an uh, abnormal embryo. So this abnormal embryo will lead into a uh, miscarriage on the first trimester. And also couples with environmental exposure to endocrine disruptors, it has been described that those couples will have higher chances to have a miscarriage because of chromosomal abnormalities as well. So let me please uh, introduce our work that we presented back in 2019 at the ESRE in Austria and Vienna as an oral presentation. And our experience at that time, we analyzed more than 2,500 products of conception and we did the analysis in different ways. We checked two different molecular techniques at that time, in that case, array CGH on next generation sequencing. And also we performed the analysis by maternal age, by gestational age, and by oocyte origin. So what we performed is we took three dissections plus an EDTA blood tube from coming from the mother or gestational carrier in order to run the STRs. We performed the molecular approach with the RACGH and NGS. And if needed, we performed the STR analysis. So protocol for the NGS was the regular protocol that we used to use for the uh, PETA. And then we got those kind of profiles. You will know that uh, on top we have a profile that is uh, euploid, normal, uh, XX, 
on the middle we have a monosomy for chromosome X, monosomy 45X, that I will show you that it's one of the most prevalent between eight to 10% of cases of miscarriage on the first trimester are due to this uh, kind of monosomy. And also on bottom, we have trisomy 15 that also is one of the most prevalent ones and I will show you the data before. But what happened when we have a result such as euploid, normal, female or male? Because I said before, in conventional karyotype, we cannot uh, differentiate between these results is coming from fetosome from the mother. So then we are going to do an extra analysis. We are going to run the as STRs, the short tandem repeats, and we will compare between the maternal sample. Again, I, I said before, we are going to extract a, a maternal uh, blood in order to extract the DNA. And we are going to compare with the DNA of the fetal sample. And you can see that all the peaks or alleles are exactly the same. And this is because this is this sample, this DNA is not coming from the fetus, but from the mother. So we got maternal cell contamination because sometimes it's kind of difficult in, to get the real products of conception. So in this case, we won't be able to give you a result as a normal or abnormal, but maternal cell contamination. In this other example, you can see that we obtained that some peaks or alleles are exactly the same. And this is good because we are inherited those ones from the mother, but we can observe other ones that are on the fetus, but not on the mother. And this is because we are inherited these, those ones from the parental size, from the father. So this is telling us that this sample is coming from the fetus and not from the mother. Even though we obtain a result such as normal female, we do know that we are providing you a result that is coming from fetus and not from the mother. And even we can detect if these cases came from a polyploidy. In this case, you can see in the slide, we should observe one or two peaks, depends if there's homozygous or heterozygous. But you can see here that in some STRs, we are seeing like three different peaks. This means that this miscarriage happens because a triploidy on the fetus even though we can observe the gender of the fetus, you can see on the bottom uh, left, uh, the peaks that are coming from the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is the double of the size. This means that it has around the double of the DNA. So this means that this uh, gender would be 69 X, Y, Y. So let's go with the results that we presented again with uh, more than 2000 and 500 samples of products of conception. The first analysis, again, we, we compare in between those techniques, molecular approaches, array CGH and NGS, and we did not found any statistical differences. So from now onwards, I'm going to present you the results both together, okay? So first of all, informative results, again, it was 99% of informative results. And this is really important in order to provide with a better counseling to the patient once you get them the miscarriage uh, with you. Then also I have to indicate that around 13% of the cases, we could not find anything but maternal uh, cells. So at the end of the day, we have to provide with these kind of results, even though we analyze three different samples when we receive those ones. And the percentage of abnormal results was 53% in these cases. Let's check the results by chromosome. So if we focus in monosomies, and remember that usually monosomies lead into an implantation failure and trisomies lead into a miscarriage or a baby with a chromosomopathy. But in this case, we find sometimes monosomies, even in the miscarriages. And you can see that most of them, 85% of them, were monosomies for the sex chromosome, mostly, as I said before, 45X. But also we found another kind of monosomies Although with very low frequency, the monosomy 21 is one of the highest incidents with this 11.5%. But we found also monosomies for chromosome 13, for chromosome 22. And as far as we know, it was the first time that monosomies for chromosomes 4 and 15 were reported in a product of conception. Talking about trisomies, they follow a pattern similar as uh, previously published studies with higher incidence for chromosome 16 with 17.6% and 22 with 16.6% uh, 
follow but cr for chromosomes 15, 13, and 21 with 13, 7, and 6.5 percentage respectively. So let's check the results by maternal age. You can observe that uh, what should expect uh, from our patients when they have a miscarriage. So from patients that are under 35 years old, we should expect around 50, 45 to 50% of chromosomal abnormalities in the approach of conception. If we move to patients from 36 year olds to 40 years old, the percentage of chromosomal abnormalities would be between 60 to 65%. And if we have patients around 41, 42 years old, look at this, 70% of the products of conception are going to be abnormal. Then we move into patients older than 42 years old, and you can see a drop from 70 to 50%. Well, we think that this is a limitation of our analysis. We think that in realistic, this should be higher, around 80 to 90%, but we realize that some patients that are coming after a miscarriage from an IVF clinic, they didn't write it down at the test recognition form that are patients coming from egg donation program. So this is why we are putting here some patients that probably were under uh, egg donation program. And this is why the results were lower than this 70%. But this is kind of a limitation of, of this kind of analysis. So let's move also and let's talk about multiple aneuploidy. Multiple aneuploidy means like you will have two or more chromosomal abnormalities in the products of conception. And you can see that below 38 years old, you will have around four to 6% of multiple aneuploidies. But when the patient has 39 years old and older, this will be increased up to 21% in patients older 42 years old. Then if you check for uh, monosomies for chromosome X and polyploidies, they tend to decrease when the patients are older. Let's move into the results for gestational age. You can observe that the lower the gestational age, the bigger the maternal cell contamination. And, and this is true because you do know that uh, when um, you have a um, miscarriage in a uh, six week of gestation, sometimes it's really hard to find the products of conception, any material to analyze. And obviously when the gestational age, it's uh, longer than seven, eight, nine, even 12 weeks, you will have more material in order to analyze. So the, the, the lower the gestational age, the bigger the maternal cell contamination. You can see also that the percentage of uh, abnormal products of conception in patients under nine weeks, it's around 50%. Between nine to 12 weeks, it's around 60, 65%. But after 12 weeks of gestation, it drops up to 34, to the half. And this is because we talked about, we talked before at the very beginning of the, of the lecture, we said that after this 12 week of gestation, we have kind of a biological barrier. And then after that, we should check another, another kind of possibilities of the miscarriage, but not the chromosomal ones, because we just, you, you can see here that it drops up to 50%. So also you can observe in here that the, uh, the lower the gestational age, the higher the percentage of multiple aneuploidies. And again, Talking about multiple aneuploidies, uh, it's two or more aneuploidies. In this case, um, as an opposite that when we observe in embryos, usually if you, you find uh, multiple aneuploidies should be two only because uh, we only had like two with three aneuploidies and only one in this 2,500 with four aneuploidies. Usually such as happens in the, in the embryos, usually when, in the embryos when you have uh, multiple aneuploidies, they trained to block or arrest, get arrested uh, before to uh, achieve blastocyst stage. In here happens the same. Multiple aneuploidies is going to block the, the fetus and had a miscarriage earlier, as you can see in here. After 11 weeks of, of gestation, we didn't get any multiple aneuploidy. And what about the oocyte origin? You can observe in here that uh, the percentage of abnormal resort and patients with own oocytes, it's around 55%. And it drops to 30% when we have a patient in an egg donor program. But still, 30% of the patients with an egg donor program that get a miscarriage is because chromosomal abnormalities. So we have to think about 
to test also those kind of products of conception. Uh, if we take it out to um, we check specifically the abnormalities for the sex monosomy, mostly again 45x, you can observe 9% of sex monosomy in patients with own oocytes, and it has 37% in patients with donated oocytes with a sex uh, monosomy. And um, we think that it has, uh, it, this is because it has been described that 80% of cases with a monosomy for the sexual chromosome, it is due to the absence of the paternal sexual chromosome, unlike the nucleides of the autosome that are mostly, you know, of maternal origin. And this is the cause that we think that this is caused because it's higher in patients with a donated oocyte than in patients with own oocytes. Here, the paternal side, it has more power than in the other cycles that obviously mother, the maternal side has more power because chromosomal abnormalities, you know, that are going to be more prevalent in those patients with uh, age that it's older. And this is the algorithm that we propose for you and your patients. Once you have a first trimester miscarriage, you analyze, obviously you have an anamnesis in your clinic with the parental age, the number of miscarriages, gestational age, type of miscarriage and so on. And then you analyze the products of conception, again, products of conception plus the maternal or gestational carrier blood. And we are going to analyze by NGS, next generation sequencing. We can have a result normal, euploid, and then we perform the STRs, the short tandem repeats in order to rule out or discard maternal cell contamination. If there's no maternal cell contamination, if it's a really euploid normal uh, product of conception, then you have to go for the etiologic diagnosis, like physical exam or another study such as immunological endometrial thrombophilias, endocrine, and so on. But if you have an abnormal, an euploid result, you have to check if it is numerical abnormality, because if it is numerical abnormality, then you can counsel the patient to go through a next cycle with a PGTI study, or they might change the gametes, use an egg donor or an sperm donor, or they can go ahead with a, a, another pregnancy and do a prenatal test, a non-invasive prenatal test that we do know that is a really a safe and, and accurate right now. And if you have a structural abnormality, then you have to check the karyotype of the parents. You, you might counsel them to do a cytogenetic study to the parents. And we find that this study is normal. They have a normal karyotype. So then the abnormality is de novo. And we have, con we have to counsel the patients to do, again, the before PETA, change of gametes or prenatal test. But if we find that the parents, one of them has an abnormal karyotype, uh, so then the abnormality was inherited from them. And then you have to counsel the patients to go uh, to an IVF cycle with a PTA-SR for structural rearrangements. And then they might decide to change the gametes or go ahead with a pregnancy and then do a prenatal test. So all of this, usually uh, it, when happen a miscarriage in the first trimester, we do recommend to do the products of conception because mostly the problem is going to be about the chromosomes. But how about after 12 weeks of gestation that we say that drops in a half the chances to have a chromosomal abnormality? So I'm going to explain only uh, one. Uh, this is a real case that we did in our genomics. And this was a fetus at 14 weeks of gestational age that found to have a multiple renal sized encephalothele and polydactyly. So the family has a positive history. Uh, parents had one stillbirth with a similar condition. So we were suspecting that, and the physician actually making the ultrasound was suspecting a Michael Gruber uh, uh, syndrome in that fetus. So let me show you this uh, tool that is real interesting. We have this tool in iGenomics, and this tool works like you have, uh, we are making an ultrasound, and you put in here phenotyping that you are finding for the fetus. I said before that some, uh, some findings on the ultrasound, we can write it down here some of those phenotypes and this tool is going to show up which panel we should use for try to check the probes of conception so in this case we have this panel with the phenotyping that we were writing down in this tool and then we perform the whole exome sequencing in this case for for these products of conception so what we found in this uh, analysis was that the fetus was a carrier of a pathogenic splicing variant in the TCTN2 gene. And this 
was associated with a Michael Gruber syndrome. So we found the, the reason why this, this uh, pitus had a miscarriage. And uh, we do know that this result was compatible with the phenotype that the physician found at the ultrasound. So then both parents should be heterozygous carriers of the same pathogenic variant. And the couple, for this reason, this recessive condition, uh, has a 25% chance of transmitting both pathogenic variants to offspring and developing the disease. At the end, we've got the reason why uh, those patients had this miscarriage, but also we do recommend that a genetic analysis of this variant to perform in both parents, but also at at-risk relatives uh, that would be recommended. So um, this is good not only to know what happened, the, what happened the miscarriage, but also to do a better counseling to the parents and even to uh, uh, at-risk relatives. So just to conclude, I would like to tell you that uh, to analyze by a molecular approach of the uh, products of conception would be really, really interesting to give an explanation to the patient why the pregnancy loss has occurred, if it is abnormal result. And if it is normal, we know that we will have to focus on another possible cause that is not chromosomal, like endometrial, endocrine, immunological, thrombophilic, so on. You can give to your patient best reproductive advice for a future cycle, whether it's trying to get pregnant naturally at home or going through ART. And knowing that the majority of miscarriages are due to chromosomal causes and that once we have a chromosomal abnormality, the probability of having another abnormal abortion increases, we consider the importance of this type of study and thus be able to assess whether to refer the patient to a reproductive endocrinologist Molecular techniques such as next generation sequencing combined with the use of short tandem repeats make it possible to increase the efficiency of the analysis of chromosomal abnormalities of products of conception compared to conventional cytogenetic techniques, improving the percentage of samples with informative results and reducing the rate of false negatives caused by contamination with maternal DNA. And if we have a miscarriage after, after 12 weeks of gestation or with an abnormal ultrasound, genetic counseling to perform the best approach would be indicated. And prior to say goodbye, let me, let me tell you that here in iGenomics, we are going to, with you, all, with all of this, so we are gonna give you genetic counseling from the first part to the end. So uh, at the end, what we would like to achieve is not a pregnant woman, but a healthy boy be, baby at home. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to have any questions if you, if you want to ask anything, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nasser. Uh, you always have the inspiring uh, speech. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think okay. uh, because of the time, we only uh, will ask you one question. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, um, you listed uh, quite a few questions for uh, uh, miscarriages in the in the beginning, uh, including chromosome and also immunology, uh, microbiome and obesity. And I think right, uh, we, we recently see something uh, in, in Taiwan that uh, there's another company also presenting a, uh, a window of, of implementation test, uh, which is similar to ERA. Uh, and then they uh, claim that they can uh, solve the uh, uh, miscarriage issue. So I would like to kind of ask you a question that do you think, as it, since you're the expert of the miscarriage, uh, do you think that WOI can be one of the reasons for miscarriages or not? Uh, if not, then uh, what's, what's your uh, comment about this? So uh, there's nothing nothing to do with the, with the ERA or another tool that is checking for the transcriptomics on the endometrium. It doesn't make sense uh, 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 at all. So we, we, uh, we talk about that around uh, 50 to 60 percent causes is going to be about the chromosomes. And there's another causes that could be the microbiome, uh, the pathogens uh, such as Garnerella, Prevotella, Topovium. And uh, this is something that is related with the miscarriages. I told you obesity or antiphospholipid syndrome. But doing an analysis for the endometrium, it's not gonna, it's not gonna harm and it's not gonna happen that it's going to be involved in a miscarriage. Obviously, because you are doing this kind of test one month before or even more, even more because we do know that the ERA lasts for the several months, even years. 
So there's not such a relation in between both of them. So uh, I don't know what would be the reason uh, that uh, somebody can think that the, the, this kind of test could be involved into a miscarriage. I, I don't know for sure. Okay, okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, and, and also you mentioned about the vancor biome and, and I remember, uh, I think uh, Ima uh, Moleno also uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, has had a few cases about, uh, you know, miscarriage cases according to, to a uh, dysbiotic microbiome, right? Yes, this is something that we can analyze actually. With only one biopsy, we are going to run the next generation sequencing. We will analyze uh, you know, the RNA for the human endometrium in order to know the window of implantation. But we also are analyzing the DNA coming from the pathogens, and these pathogens can lead into a miscarriage. So then analyzing the endometrial or the URA for the, these pathogens, you can know if patient will have a miscarriage or not. Actually, we have papers that we publish with a patient that had miscarriages having Garnerella, and we treat it with antibiotics and Garnerella is still there. So the physician didn't recommend the patient to have the, the transfer, but the patient wanted. So physician had the transfer, a patient had a miscarriage, and then they treated again, they removed the Garnerella and transferred without the Garnerella. So pathogens can cause the miscarriage, and chromosomal abnormalities can cause the miscarriage. Doing uh, analysis like ERA cannot cause uh, miscarriage. Okay, great, great. Uh, thanks for the great answer, Nasser. So I would like you to stay uh, while I close this, uh, this seminar, okay? Sure. Can you stay with me and then uh, while I'm closing this seminar, okay? So, okay, Absolutely. it looks like we have uh, completed our, 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 all of the speakers have uh, presented uh, their uh, great works. And uh, thank you all uh, very much, our uh, esteemed speakers today. And also uh, thank you all for joining us for the, our second iGenomics APEC uh, regional uh, uh, online symposium. We have touched on uh, many of the diagnostic tools in our service and also uh, different topics. Uh, in uh, by, by uh, the speakers in different countries. And if you have any questions, uh, still free, feel free to uh, contact us uh, right through our office, uh, emails. Um, uh, we're, we're very uh, happy to answer the question for you. So on a final note, uh, we uh, are planning to have another uh, symposium sometime this year, and I hope you can also join us. And we will invite more speakers from different countries to, uh, to, uh, to talk about their works. Um, so to do us know the feedback, uh, whatever you have, you may have, and any questions are all welcome. So we will see you next time. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.